the rule in force versus arbitral. Then we will look at uh, what we call representative action. Then we will finalize by looking at what we call derivative action. Derivative action. So we'll also look at what we call derivative action, derivative action. So <clears throat> who is a member of a company? Who is a member of a company? Who is a member of a company? So a member of a company is simply someone whose name actually appears on the register of members, on the register of members of a company. So a member of a company is simply a person actually whose name actually appears in what we call the register of members of a company. So the register of members of a company is simply an enlisting of all persons who are actually members of, of the company. So this particular term we are calling member of a company, sometimes it is usually, usually used interchangeably with shareholder with the term shareholder it is usually used interchangeably with the term shareholder quite obviously when you actually become a shareholder of the company you'll become the member of the company and of course your name now will actually be enlisted or be included in the register of members of of the company so once your name actually appears there by the virtue of you being a shareholder in a company then you'll automatically become the member of the company and your name will likely be included in the register of members of the company. So we are saying a member of a company is any person whose name actually appears in the register of members of a company. By register of members of a company, seems it is raining across, it is raining across and uh, there's a challenge. So there's a challenge in being able to hear. So I think I've recorded. So probably maybe the video will be shared later on, but you can try your best to see if the rain will actually be over, you can be able to follow the class. So we are seeing this particular term shareholder and member is, it is usually used interchangeably. And as I'm saying, quite obviously, when you buy shares in a company and become a shareholder, you'll automatically become the member of the company and the name, your name will likely be included in the register of members of the company, which will actually be maintained at the registered office of the company. So it is a requirement that the company actually maintains what we call a register of members that will basically enlist as to who is actually a member of the company. So having mentioned that, as I'm saying, basically when you buy shares, a shareholder is simply a person who has actually acquired shares or has bought what we call shares in the company. So once you buy shares in a company or you acquire shares in a company or any company, you'll become the shareholder of the company. And quite obviously, basically now you'll become the member of the company. So if you look here, we are saying ways of how to become a member. Ways of how to become a member. We are saying number three here, what you're supposed to know, ways of how to become a member. So you'll be able to realize that those ways of actually becoming a member, most of them basically, will lead you, they basically lead you to basically acquiring shares. So once you've acquired shares, you'll become the shareholder, then you'll become the member of the company. So these two terms are usually used, usually used interchangeably. Of course, a member of a company will be like the shareholder of the company. And sometimes like the shareholder of the company will actually be a member of the company. So once you buy shares, you'll become the member of the company. So it is quite obvious what I mean by this, that any shareholder of a company is a member of that company. And of course, his name will now be included in the register of members of the company. So having mentioned that, that these particular two terms are usually used interchangeably. And quite obviously, when you buy shares in a company, you'll become a member. You must be able to realize that under certain special circumstances, you'll be able to find that sometimes a person can just only be a member of the company and not actually a shareholder. Or sometimes it can just be a shareholder and not actually a member of the company. Remember, I've said the terms are usually used interchangeably. And I've also said, quite obviously, when you buy shares in a company, you'll become the member of the company. But here I'm mentioning right now that sometimes under certain circumstances, exceptional circumstances, you might find that a person is simply only a member of the company and not actually a shareholder of the company. Or sometimes you might find 
that particular person is just a, a certain person is just maybe only a shareholder and is not actually a member even though we've mentioned quite obviously when you buy shares in a company you would become the shareholder and become the member of the company but under exceptional circumstances you might find that only a person is just a member and is not actually a shareholder or sometimes is just a shareholder and is not actually a member so the key interest here is for you now to know what are those exceptional circumstances. The key interest here is now for you to know, since I've mentioned it right now, is that for you to know that under what those circumstances, will you be able to find that only a person is just a shareholder and is not actually a member of the company. The first instance that we can be able to mention, the first instance that we can be able to mention is for example, if we have a company that is limited by guarantee. A company that is limited by guarantee. A company that is limited by guarantee. In this type of a company, we'll have only members and no shareholders and no shareholders. We only have members and no shareholders. So once I mention this, then you must be able to remember the definition under what we looked at as types of companies under nature and classification of companies. We said that a limited company by guarantee. So you can have a limited company either by shares or you can have a limited company by guarantee. A limited company by guarantee. So a limited company by shares will have share capital, but the one limited by guarantee doesn't have share capital, but only has members who, are, who have given assurance as to how much they can be able to contribute towards the assets in case the company is actually liquidated. So a limited company by guarantee is a type of a company whereby the members of the company have been able to give assurance or guarantee as to how much they'll be able to contribute towards the assets in case the company is actually liquidated. They don't have shares in the company. Only on formation, they have given assurance, they have given guarantee if any time this company of ours will ever go under or be liquidated, we'll be able to put in, let's say, for example, an amount of certain assets, an amount of certain assets, so that these particular assets can actually basically be utilized to pay the liabilities of the company on liquidation. So remember, as we've been singing, as we've been singing since we started this, the study of this particular uh, subject, that the time when it reaches that the life of the company has to come to an end, it is known as liquidation. And the major thing that actually happens during liquidation is the payment of liabilities, is the payment of liabilities. What we mean by liabilities, for example, creditors of the company who had actually supplied goods to the company and they have not been paid. So remember we said that the company will just not, will not actually just shut the door and we say the company has been closed down. It is normally a process. Just the same way you've seen under formation of companies that forming a company, it is a process. You don't just wake up and say, I've started a company. It is a process. It is a process. There's a promoter who undertakes certain processes before the company comes into existence. The same way when you are ending the life of a company, it is a process. And therefore, if you are forming a company limited by guarantee on formation, basically you as members of the company, you'll be able to give an assurance as to how much you'll be able to pay or basically contribute towards the assets to be utilized to pay the liabilities of the company on liquidation. So part of the process on liquidation of the company when ending the life of a company, Nikulipa Madeni, Nikulipa Kulipa Madeni, Hadi Malize, Dosa Tuseme Kampuni Imefungwa. So therefore, in this type of a company, the members will only give an assurance. There is no shares that they have actually acquired in the company. They'll just give an assurance if ever this particular company of ours will ever be liquidated. I'll put in two million to be utilized to pay the liabilities of the company. Therefore, there are no shares and there are no shareholders. It only has members. That is one of the exceptional circumstances under which in a company you'll find that we only have a person being a member and is not actually a shareholder. Is not actually a shareholder. So in a company limited by guarantee, we only have members and we don't have shareholders. We don't have shareholders. So another situation is, for example, under what we call 
transfer of shares, transfer of shares, transfer of shares. So this is another situation whereby you'll find a person either is just a member and, and not actually a shareholder of the company, or maybe a shareholder and not actually a member. What do you mean by transfer of shares? Just from the word transfer. For example, if I have shares at Safaricom, I simply transfer them to Mercy. I simply transfer them to Mercy, or maybe I transfer them to maybe Naomi. I transfer them maybe to Naomi. So Naomi, in this case, there are usually two parties under transfer of shares. So there's the transfer, and we have the transfer. There are usually two parties, so you can't see there. So there's the transfer, and we usually have the transfer. So the transfer in this case is actually Naomi, and the transfer in this case is actually Job. The transfer in this case is actually a Job. So what will happen? This particular process might take quite some time. So it happens by operation of law. It happens by operation of law. So once these particular two parties have been able to sign the transfer instrument or the transfer agreement, it will be taken that in this case, it will be taken that in this case, already the transferee has become a shareholder because he has acquired the shares from me. He has already paid me the amount to acquire the shares. And therefore, by operation of law, having deposited that transfer instrument that you have agreed with Naomi that the shares be transferred to her, Naomi automatically at that particular point actually becomes the shareholder of the company. But you'll realize that before my name is actually removed from the register of members, it might take quite some time. It might take quite some time, maybe a week, maybe three weeks, but already the shares have been acquired by Naomi. Naomi has already become a shareholder. But remember, her name has not actually even been included in the register of members. It is a process. It is a process. It might take a week or even a month because it has to be received in the company. It has to be approved by the board. So by the time the board is sitting to approve the, uh, the transfer of shares from me to Naomi, it is a process. So you'll be able to realize during that time, one month, one week, my name is actually still appearing in the register of members of the company. And what have we said? That a member of a company is any person whose name actually appears in the register of members of the company. What are you realizing here? The name of Job is actually still appearing in the register of members. But of course, the name of Naomi is not yet in the register of members. So you'll be able to see that Naomi is not actually yet a member, but Job is actually still a member of the company. In that particular situation, Job is only actually a member of the company and not actually a shareholder. The shares have already been lost to Naomi. Until when that particular process has been ended and my name has been removed from the register of members, that's when now you'll say I'm no longer a member of the company. And of course, now in this case, Naomi's name has been included in the register of members of the company. So under transfer of shares, under transfer of shares, while the process is still actually being undertaken, that point is very important. While the process of transfer is actually still being undertaken, while the process of transfer is actually still being undertaken, within the one week or one month, Job will actually still be a member of the company, while Naomi will actually already be a shareholder of the company. So remember, I've already lost but the shares. I'm no longer the shareholder during that one month, but I'm still the member in the register of members. Naomi has already acquired the shares. She's a shareholder, but she's not yet a member of the company. So that is what we mean by an exceptional circumstance under which, for example, under transfer of shares, you might find that a person is just a member of the company and is not actually a shareholder of the company. Or alternatively, is actually a shareholder and is not actually a member of the company. So remember, it is important you understand what is actually transfer of shares, although we'll still look at it when we'll be looking at shares, when we'll be looking at shares. So transfer of shares is basically where shares are transferred from one party to the other, one party to the other. There are usually two parties. So it is a contract. There are usually two parties, a contract between a transferrer, the one transferring the shares, and a transferee, the one receiving the shares. The one receiving the shares. That is what we mean by transfer of shares. So I can transfer my shares in the company to another party. So if I'm a shareholder in a company, I can be able to transfer the shares from myself to another party. So that is known as a contract 
of transfer of shares. So there are actually two parties, the transferrer and the transferee. So under transfer of shares is one of the circumstances under which you might find during the process of transfer, the person is just a member and is not actually a shareholder in the, in the company. Or alternatively, the person is just a shareholder and is not actually a member in the company. So another situation, so you said transfer of shares. So number three situation is under transmission of shares. Transmission of shares. Transmission of shares. So you know in this case now, now in this case now, Lucy will start confusing transfer of shares and transmission of shares. Lucy will start confusing transfer of shares and transmission of shares. Don't confuse. Transfer of shares, there are usually two parties. It is simply where you transfer the shares from a person known as a transferrer to the transferee. But now in this case, Lucy, under transmission, you must be able to remember. In this case, there's a situation of either the shareholder, something has happened. So there's either death, insanity, or bankruptcy of a member of the company. So there's what we call death, insanity, or bankruptcy of a member of the company. If that one actually happens, then now in this case, so under death, for example, you must be able to know that, for example, in this case, this person has left a will. So that will is actually going to be administered. So of course, he has mentioned the beneficiaries. So this particular person who was actually a shareholder of the company, he has clearly mentioned in the will that these shares of mine will actually go to my favorite son, my favorite son. My shares at Safaricom will go to my favorite son. So in case of death of such kind of a party or of such kind of a person, the shares will be transmitted to the beneficiary. The shares will be transmitted to the beneficiary, to the favorite son. The shares will be transmitted to the favorite son. So you're saying in case of what we call death, bankruptcy, bankruptcy is where a person has been declared to be bankrupt. He's not actually able to meet his obligations or pay his liability. So a Mesota, so creditors and therefore is actually declared to be bankrupt and the shares or any assets are taken over by a receiver who will be able to manage those assets and pay his liabilities on his behalf. Or we can talk about, for example, in a situation whereby we have insanity. So if a person has been declared to be insane, so the shares will be transmitted to either trustee or maybe a beneficiary or maybe a receiver. So still in this case, it is actually a process. It is by operation of, of law. So automatically under death and the will is going to be administered when it is basically presented to the company as to who's supposed to take over the shares. You'll be able to realize that the name of that person who has either died, declared to be bankrupt or insane, his name is still actually appearing in the register of members. But automatically the shares have already been lost to the beneficiary, and of course, maybe to the receiver or maybe a trustee. So in this case, the beneficiary has already become a shareholder of the company, but his name is not actually yet in the register of members. So it's still actually a process. So it might take quite some time before the company approves the removal of that person declared to be dead, bankrupt, or insane to be removed from the register of members. So until the name is actually removed, it will still actually be seen as actually being a member of the company. It will still actually be seen as to be a member of the company, still to be seen to be a member of the company. So transmission and transfer are usually process, is usually a process. So while the process is still being undertaken, then of course, for example, under the case of transmission, the person declared to be dead or maybe bankrupt or insane, his name will still appear in the register of members until the process has been ended. But of course, in this case, by operation of law, the shares have actually already been lost to either the beneficiary or maybe the receiver or maybe a trustee for the benefit of the insane uh, person. So those are some of the three key dominant situations or circumstances. You'll find that in such a situation that either person is just a member, not a shareholder, or maybe is just a shareholder and is not actually a member of the company. But what has the teacher said initially? These terms are usually used interchangeably. And quite obviously, if a person is a member of the company, then he's actually a shareholder. If he's a shareholder of the company, he's actually a member of the company. But under exceptional circumstances, you might find that it doesn't happen in that way. Sometimes a person is just a member and not a shareholder. 
and maybe it's just a shareholder and not actually a member under those three exceptional circumstances then you'll find such actually happening such actually happening but quite obviously when you buy shares in a company and become a shareholder you'll actually become a member of the company you'll become a member of the company so if they test that one then don't say it is greek i've never heard about it because it has been tested in the past probably they might actually test it also don't say it is greek i've never heard about it the teacher has actually mentioned the exceptional circumstances so i want us to look at how do you become a member of a company how do you become a member of a company how do you become a member of a company how do you become a member of a company so number one utajipata aje umekuwa member wa safaricom utajipata aje umekuwa member of safaricom utajipata aje umekuwa member of safaricom so number one, through allotment of shares allotment of shares allotment of shares number two, through what we call transfer of shares transfer of shares through what we call transmission of shares through what we call subscribing to the memorandum subscribing to the memorandum of association on formation of a company on formation of a company uh number five oh you cannot see here you cannot see there so maybe i can write it here let me write it here uh taking up qualification shares taking up qualification shares taking up qualification shares number six through the doctrine of estopel 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 so those are the ways through which you can actually become a member of the company you'll find yourself actually being called a member of the company so the first one so you can explain them one by one you can explain them one by one so the first one through allotment of shares for example if a company has done an initial public offer so initial public offer simply means the company is a public company that has floated shares so they have come up with a prospectus we'll see later on what is our prospectus under the topic of share capital so they have advertised that they are looking for people to buy its shares uh, then you as a person let's say for example in this case it is lamek so lamek basically subscribes or applies for the shares so once lamek actually applies for the shares then they like to be allotted they they'll allot you the shares maybe you want to acquire like let's say for example like a thousand shares at maybe 20 shillings each so they'll be able to allot the shares they'll be able to allot the shares so once they allot the shares quite obviously lamek you'll actually become the shareholder of that company so when you become the shareholder of that company then you'll actually basically be included in the register of members of the company so in that case you become the shareholder of the company through the allotment of the shares so once the company allows the shares on subscription of any person or any party then that particular person becomes the shareholder of the company and of course quite obviously now his name will likely be included in the register of members of the company so that is what we mean by allotment of shares so maybe on an on an initial public offer initial public offer remember you said for example uh if you can remember very well part of the characteristics let's say for example like a public company so a public company can invite members of the public to subscribe or apply for its shares so once you apply for the shares they'll be allotted allotting allotting is like now uh, basically distributing the shares so agreeing to that particular contracts contracts so agreeing to that particular contracts so they'll be able to allot the shares so once they allot the shares then you will become the shareholder of the company if they have allotted you the shares and when you become the shareholder of the company then you'll automatically become the member of the company 
transfer of shares i've explained i've explained transfer of shares i've explained transfer of shares you see it, it is a contract whereby we usually have a transfer and a transferee. A transferer transfers the shares to the transferee. So a transferer transfers the shares to the transferee. So of course they'll have agreed the terms under the share transfer form or under the share transfer instrument. For example, in this case, we could agree Job is actually transferring a thousand shares to Naomi at a price of two shillings, at a price of two shillings. So those will basically form part of the terms under that particular contract of sale of shares. So that particular transfer instrument will be able to mention as to what are, what are the number of shares being sold, who are the parties, who is the transferer, who is the transferee, and how many shares are being transferred at what price, at what price. In this case, once I transfer the shares, then of course, in this case now, Naomi becomes the shareholder of the company, becomes the shareholder of the company. You'll be able to realize that this one will appear as a way of becoming a member and also as a way of ceasing to be a member, as a way of losing membership. Because in this case, you can be able to realize Job is losing membership while Naomi is actually becoming a member. So this one appears in both becoming a member and ceasing to be a member. Becoming a member and ceasing to be a member. Who is ceasing the membership? It is actually Job. Who is actually becoming a member? It is actually Naomi. So under transfer of shares, it is one of the ways in we, under which you can become a shareholder and of course, quite obviously become a member of the company. Transmission of shares, I've already explained. I've already explained. In case of death, bankruptcy, or insanity of a member, the shares will basically be transferred or transmitted to the beneficiary, receiver, or maybe the trustee in such a case the beneficiary, receiver, or a trustee in such a case. So you can be able to see now this one person also. This one also appears in both. Eh? It appears in both because you can see there is one who is losing the membership and there's another one who is actually gaining the membership. So there's one who is actually losing the membership and there's one who is actually gaining the membership. It actually appears also in both way of becoming a member and actually way of ceasing to be a member. So transmission of shares will likely lead to the beneficiary or maybe the trustee or maybe the receiver becoming a shareholder and quite obviously now becoming a member of the company, a member of the company. Subscribing to the memorandum of, of association on formation to be among the first shareholders or probably members of the company. So once you sign that particular memorandum that will be deposited, at the registrar's office for registering the company that part, you'll be part of the first shareholders or members of the company as maybe uh, under a company limited by guarantee, then quite obviously now you'll become the member of the company. Taking up qualification shares, taking up what we call qualification shares, taking up what we call qualification shares. So qualification shares, what are qualification shares? What are qualification shares? What are qualification shares? What we mean by qualification shares, we mean that Helen, when you'll become, let's say, for example, when Helen will become, and of course she will become, when Helen will become, and of course she will become, Helen will become a director at Safaricom. When you will become a director at Safaricom, Helen, you will likely basically be required to take up some shares once you become the director. So those shares that are normally taken up by the director or a person appointed to be a director of a company are usually known as qualification shares. Failure for you, Helen, to take up these particular shares at Safaricom, you will be disqualified from serving as a director at Safaricom. So you must be able to know right now that you'll be forced to take up those qualification shares. So what are qualification shares? Qualification shares are simply shares that are normally taken up by a person appointed to be a director of the company. So we normally say that financial prudence actually requires that when you're actually appointed as a director of a company, it is a requirement that you take up some shares in the company. You become a part owner. Remember, you are going to be appointed to be a director of that particular company by the shareholders. You'll basically be safeguarding the interest of the shareholders. For you to work 
prudently for them as shareholders lazima pia ukue mmoja wao lazima pia ukue mmoja wao as one of the owners of the company because those decisions that basically will be making will likely also be affecting you as a part owner financial prudence requires that when you become a director in a company you take up some shares these shares are known as qualification shares they are known as qualification shares and what do you realize now when helen will take up the qualification shares helen will become a director at the same time and of course also a shareholder and what have we said when you become a shareholder in a company you will become a member in the company that is what we mean by taking up qualification shares that's what we mean by taking up qualification shares so that's what we mean by taking up qualification shares doctrine of estoppel doctrine of estoppel becoming a member through what we call doctrine of estoppel what do you mean by doctrine of estoppel in this case let's say for example your name actually appears by mistake in the register of members maybe you are supposed to be removed from being a member of the company but it was by mistake you, your name was, was not actually removed so any actions you take while your name still actually appears to be in the register of members you cannot deny the fact that you are actually a member of the company let's say for example in this case job had already lost his shares to naomi but in this case job still actually his name are still appears there and of course he sneaks himself even into the members meetings even into the general general meetings of the company and they actually basically participate in the decisions of the company while his name still actually appears by mistake by that particular fact you cannot deny before the court that those actions you took while your name was actually still appearing by mistake in the register of members that you are not actually a member of the company for example if basically you proceeded to participate in the meetings of the company you took even dividends you cannot deny that during that particular period before they realized that your name was actually appearing by mistake in the register of members that you are not actually a member of the company in such a case basically now we say you'll be taken to be a member of the company through what we call the doctrine of estoppel if your name appears in the register of members of a company by mistake those actions you've actually undertaken while your name appears as a member of the company by mistake you can't deny those particular actions so remember you know actually a member of the company you enjoy certain rights for example you are entitled to getting notices of meetings attending meetings voting at meetings even being able to inspect the registers of the company including register of members so those actions you actually undertaken while your name was actually still appearing by mistake ways ukakuja later on ukaruka eh jinangu ilikuwa kwa register by mistake hizo vitu msini msiniekelee msiniekelee i participated in appointment of an auditor of the company i was not actually a member my name was actually appearing by mistake you can't say such since you participated while your name was actually still appearing by mistake it will be taken that you are actually a member of the company in such a case now we say you become you been basically been realized to be a member of the company by what we call the doctrine of estoppel by what we call the doctrine of estoppel so those are basically the major ways of how you can actually basically become a member of the company you can actually basically become a member of the company so the doctrine of estoppel the doctrine of estoppel if your name appears by mistake in the register of members of the company you cannot deny the fact that the actions you've actually undertaken while your name actually is appearing by mistake that you are not a member of the company you will be taken to be a member of the company through what we call the doctrine of estoppel if your name actually appears in the register of members by mistake the actions you've actually undertaken while your name still appears by mistake in the register of members you can't deny the fact that you are actually a member of the company for example if you participated in voting at the company's meetings uwezi ukakuja ukaruka baadaye ukasema jina langu ilikuwa inapia kwa register by mistake kwa hivyo don't take me as one of the persons who participated it will be taken that you are actually a member of the company even though your name was actually still appearing by mistake because you participated so you can't deny those particular actions you took that are expected of a member of the company for example being able to get dividends getting notices attending meetings voting at meetings and all other rights that a member of the company is actually supposed to enjoy that is what we mean by you becoming a member of the company through the doctrine of estoppel through the doctrine of estoppel through the doctrine of estoppel
So those are the ways through which you can actually become a member of the company, how you can become a member of the company, how you can become a member of the company, a member of the company. So I want us now to look at how do you seize? So how do you lose membership? How do you seize membership of the company? How do you lose membership of the company? How do you lose membership of the company? So you can have transfer of shares, so death of a member, bankruptcy of a member, insanity of a member, uh, liquidation of the company, liquidation of the company, you can have lien on shares, you can have lien on shares, you can have mortgaging of shares, so mortgaging of shares, mortgaging of shares. So mortgaging of shares, lien on shares, liquidation of the company, insanity, bankruptcy, death, or transfer of shares, or transfer of shares. So I think I've explained transfer of shares. So do I really need to repeat? Do I really need to repeat? I don't have to repeat. I don't have to repeat. You understand. We have two parties, the transferrer and the transferee. So the transferee is gaining membership. The transferrer is losing membership. Death of a member, in case of death, the shares will basically be transmitted to the beneficiary. So the person who has died, so basically loses membership. Bankruptcy. If a person has been declared to be bankrupt, so he loses uh, the shares to the receiver. He loses the shares to a person known as a receiver. So in such a case, basically the bankrupt person loses membership. Insanity, so the person has been, been declared to be insane, so the shares can be lost to a trustee. So a trustee can take over the shares on behalf of the insane party. Liquidation of the company, so if the life of the company is to come to an end, so basically it simply means that once the liquidation has happened, so they have ended the life of the company, how can you be a shareholder or a member in a company of, of a company that is not in existence? So that cannot happen. So once liquidation has happened, so all the shareholders and members lose their membership of the company. So they lose the shareholding. And of course now also they lose membership. You cannot be a shareholder or a member 
in a company that is not in existence. So remember, we are saying liquidation is the process of ending the life of a company. It is a process of ending the life of a company. So once it has been undertaken, it simply means that the company has been dissolved. It is no longer a person under the law. So you cannot basically be a shareholder in a company that is not in existence. In such a case, you lose membership. So you lose membership when the liquidation has been done. Lien on shares, lien on shares, lien on shares, lien on uh, shares, lien on shares. So in this case, we can be able to use an example. What do you mean by lien on shares? In this case, it is where basically a company with holds the shares of a shareholder is actually basically also a creditor to the company. It's actually also a creditor to the company. So they, if they have that particular right under the articles, then they can be able to withhold the shares. And of course, if this particular person who is actually the shareholder is not actually able to pay the due amount to the company, then in such a case, he'll actually lose the, the share. So they can forfeit the shares or basically take over the shares of that particular shareholder who is actually indebted or actually credit, who is actually a, uh, a debtor to uh, the company or basically owes or is actually indebted to the, to the company. In this case, you can be able to use an example, you can be able to use an example of Lamek. So you can be able to use an example of Lamek. So this guy known as Lamek, Lamek is quite entrepreneurial. Lamek is quite entrepreneurial. So this guy Lamek is actually basically a major shareholder at East African Breweries Limited. He's actually a major shareholder at East African Breweries Limited. So Lamek also, since he's actually also very entrepreneurial, Lamek has actually been able to set up the best, has been able to set up the best bar and restaurant in Nairobi Central Business District. So he has set up a bar and restaurant in Nairobi Central Business District. He's actually very entrepreneurial. He's very entrepreneurial. This guy, Lamek, is very entrepreneurial. So he has set up a bar and restaurant in Nairobi Central Business District. So in this case, you can be able to realize that Lamek basically gets his supplies from East African Breweries Limited, where he's actually a shareholder. So he gets them actually on credit. So he buys them actually on credit. He buys them on credit. So they make supplies of, let's say, for example, in this case, a million in a month, a million in a month, and they give him a two-month credit period. So if basically if they supply today, then Lamek will likely be able to pay for this particular supplies in the month of June. So it happens that Lamek has been able to get the supplies of one million in April or basically probably in May. But of course, after a month or maybe after a few weeks, so COVID hits, and of course, this particular business of his is not actually really performing. So Lamek is not actually able to pay for this particular a million that was basically given to him on credit. So you can be able to see that Lamek is actually indebted to EABL. So business is not actually doing so well. EABL is actually on his neck to be able to pay for the supplies. At the same time, Lamek is actually a shareholder at East African Breweries Limited. So you are saying if the articles of association of East African Breweries Limited actually allow, then in this case, they can be able to withhold the shares of Lamek at EABL. Let's assume Lamek has shares worth 2 million at EABL. So you can be able to see he's not actually able to pay because of the COVID pandemic to EABL. But EABL, on the other hand, has some shares for Lamek. If the articles or the rules governing the internal affairs of EABL allow, they can be able to withhold the shares of Lamek until Lamek is actually able to pay for the 1 million that was actually supplied to him on, on credit. If EABL does that, we say EABL have been able to exercise what we call the right of lien over Lamek's shares. So what we mean by lien on shares, it is simply whereby a company, if allowed by its articles of association, can be able to withhold the shares of a shareholder who is actually indebted to the company until when he's actually able to pay off for those particular shares. It simply means that Lamek will lose the shareholding in EABL unless Lamek is actually able to pay or maybe if the business basically starts performing well after the pandemic, then probably he can be able to pay the amount and get back his shares. Failure to do so, they can be able to take over the shares. They can be able to take over the shares or actually basically forfeit Lamex shares. If they forfeit Lamex shares, you can be able to see Lamex will no longer be a shareholder at EABL. And in this case, if he's no longer a shareholder at EABL, he will lose membership at East African Breweries Limited. That is what we mean by lien on shares. 
the right provided to a company under its articles of a, to be able to withhold the shares of a shareholder who is actually also indebted to the company, who is actually also indebted to the company, who is actually also indebted to the company. That is what we mean by lien on shares, lien on shares. That's what we mean by lien on shares. Mortgaging of shares, mortgaging of shares. Mortgaging of shares, it is where a shareholder of the company actually basically uses his shares like an asset or basically a security to be able to get a loan or financing from someone or maybe like a bank or maybe a circle. So in this case, the shares will actually be charged as an asset. Failure to pay for this particular loan, it simply means that the bank will take over the shares. If they take over the shares, it simply means that now in this case, the shareholder will lose membership because he has lost the shares. Mortgaging of shares, it is where a person uses these shares as a security to get a loan from a financial. Failure to pay for the shares, it simply means that the shares will be taken over by the lender, or maybe in this case, like the bank. So there are usually two parties under mortgaging of shares, the mortgager and the mortgagee. The mortgager and the mortgagee. So the mortgagee in this case, the mortgagee is the lender. The mortgager is the borrower. The mortgagee is the lender. The mortgager is the borrower. So if the mortgager, the borrower, is not actually able to pay for the loan, shares being an asset and of course can be used as a security to get a loan from a financial, they can be charged. If you fail to pay for them, to pay, to pay for that particular loan, then it simply means that the shares can be taken over by the lender. If the lender takes over the shares, they become the shares of the lender. And of course, you as the borrower, you lose the shares. And of course, if you lose the shares, you will automatically lose the membership of the company. You will actually automatically lose the membership of the company. You will automatically lose the membership of, of the company. So that is what we mean by mortgaging of shares. That is what we mean by mortgaging of shares. So you can be able to add another one, number eight, valid surrender of shares, valid surrender of shares. So when you validly surrender your shares, you'll actually also lose membership of the company. Ukisare shares zako wa kampuni, so maybe you just leave them, so you don't claim for them. So you lose membership of the company, valid surrender of shares. So valid surrender of shares. So those are the ways of how a person can seize to be a member of the company. So surely if they ask for, just mention five, then they put their five marks or they ask you to mention five and explain that they put their 10 marks. Utakosa kupepeta iyo swali. Utakosa kupepeta iyo swali in an exam situation because we've mentioned like eight of them and we've explained properly. So if they ask for five, utakosa kupepeta hiyo swali, utaipepeta na useme i max dimeyeka kibindoni. It has been tested like three or four times in the past. So it's something you must actually be able to remember and never forget about it. Just remember what the teacher is actually saying here. Mortgaging of shares, and of course, lien on shares, death, bankruptcy, or insanity, transfer. Of course, if you can be able to mention them, then you can be able to remember to explain them very easily. You can be able to mention, remember to explain them very easily. Remember to explain them very easily. So we can look at the register of members. We can now look at the register of members.
So I think we can uh, we can proceed. So that was just a small uh, break. So we can, we can proceed. So we can proceed. We can proceed. So we can proceed. So a uh, register of members or um, and index of members, register of members and index of members. So I've, as I've already explained, a register of members is basically just like the an enlisting of all the members of the company, all the members of the company and a listing of all the members of the company. So what will be the contents? So what will be the contents? What will be the contents? It will basically contain things like the name of the member, name of the member, address of the member, address of the member, uh, to contain also the number of shares held by the member, number of shares held by the member, the number of shares held by the member, number of shares held by the member. Also, what will be there? Also, what will be there? Also, what will be there? So number of shares held by the member, debts, when one became a member one became a member also date of exit as a member 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 so those will be part of the contents of the register of members because in, they could ask what are the contents of a register of members or what will be contained in a register of members. So the name of that member, address of the member, so the number of shares that uh, this member is actually holding in the company, date when he actually became a member, and of course, if there's an exit, date of exit of the member, date of exit of the member. So part of also what you need to be able to know about the register of members the register of members of the company will actually be maintained at the registered office of the company. So that is where it will be kept, at the registered office of the company. So where the registered office of the company is, that's where the register of members will actually be maintained. Alternatively, it can be kept at any branch of the company, at any branch of the company. Maybe the company has several branches. So they can choose maybe at where the main office is, is actually, that's where basically they can be able to keep the register. So any branch of the company can also be able to keep or ensure it is maintaining the register of members of the company. So apart from being kept at the registered office of the company, it can also be kept or maintained at any branch of the company. Number three, alternatively, it can also basically be kept or maintained at a place where a person who normally actually makes amendments to it or basically makes changes to it actually sits or maybe where his actually office is so later on we'll be able to see that <clears throat> this register of members of the company in a company it is mostly normally maintained by a person known as a company secretary by a person known as a company secretary by a person known as a company secretary so you'll see that the company secretary could actually be an in-house officer or alternatively you might find that certain companies have been able to outsource the function of company secretary. So they have given that mandate of company secretarial services to a registered firm of company secretaries to provide company secretarial services. And part of the work of a company secretary, it is normally to maintain the register of members, make any changes to it once they have been approved, either include the name of a member or maybe remove the name of the member or make any amendments to it. So let's assume in this case now, the company has been able to outsource the function. It was given to a firm of registered company secretaries. They are the ones maintaining the register of members. Also in this case now, the register of members, apart from being kept, apart from being kept at the registered office or any branch of the company, number three also, it can be maintained at that registered firm providing company secretarial services. So it can also basically be kept at a place where the person who normally makes amendments or changes to the register actually sits or is basically located. So that is basically what you need to be able to know about the location of the register of members, the location of the register 
of members, the location of the register of members. And then also you need to be able to know that under certain circumstances, then changes can be made to the register of members. For example, if a person name actually is not actually appearing, so the company will be forced to include the name of that particular person. Or also changes can be made in a situation whereby, for example, if a person name actually appears by mistake in the register of members of the company, then the company has to ensure it has made the changes by ensuring that name has been removed. So if someone realizes that his name is not in the register of members of the company, he can be able to complain. And of course, you can be able to seek for a court action. So once that has been realized, you can seek for a court action. And of course, the court will give a court order that the changes be made to the register of members. So once the company receives that particular order from the court, then it, it will have no reason to object to such amendments or changes to the register of members. So the changes can actually also be made in such circumstances, in, in such circumstances where, for example, the name actually appears by mistake. So Lamek, you can mute yourself there. So Lamek, you can mute yourself there. So if, for example, if your name actually appears by mistake, or for example, in this case, if someone's name has been omitted, then the changes will actually be made to the register of members, to the register of members. Then we have index. So remember here we are saying index of members. Remember here we are saying index of members, index of members, index of members. So if the company has more than 50 members, if the company has more than 50 members, then it is a requirement that it maintain, instead of having to maintain a register of members, it will maintain what we call an index of members. So apart from just being an enlisting, now index of members will now be like in a card form. Each and every member with like a unique card, but of course the contents will still remain the same. You'll be able to realize from the card all these that we've talked about. You'll be able to realize from the card all these that we have actually been able to talk about about a member of the company. So if the company has more than 50 members, it will maintain an index of members that will basically be like in a card form, each and every member having like a card whereby his details are normally actually maintained. So all of them are actually put together. And of course, the card will basically have all these contents you are talking about, the register of members, about the register of, of members. So that is what you need to be able to know about the register and index of members, the register and index of members, the register and index of members, the register and index of members. So if the company has more than 50 members, then it will be required under the Companies Act to maintain an index of members. That would be like in a card form that contains all the details pertaining to a register of members, pertaining details uh, concerned with the register of members. So uh, we can look at uh, the majority rule. So the majority rule. So the majority rule or the rule in force, sometimes it is known as the rule in force versus habitual, the rule in force versus habitual.
So maybe I'll just explain what uh, it talks about. Then I think uh, uh, from our next class, then basically we'll go into deeper details on the facts concerning this particular uh, case law, concerning this particular case law. So the majority rule, so just from the word majority, so it basically depicts that, for example, in a company now in this case, the majority will have their way, so while the minority will basically have their say, will have their say. So that is basically what it actually uh, depicts. So it normally states that, so this particular rule actually normally states that, that no, there is no way a person can be able to bring an action. So listen very carefully. It normally states that there is no way a person, an individual person can be able to bring an action in a court of law on behalf of the company. So you can't bring an action. You can't basically let a case equal 40 on behalf of your company. You cannot bring an action in a court of law on behalf of the company, but it is only the company itself. It is only the company itself by acting upon a decision taken by the majority of the members of the company. So fundamentally, basically what you should be able to realize from what I've just said, is that this particular case law actually recognizes the principle of separate legal entity. We say that the company is a separate entity from the owners, and therefore it can be able to sue or be sued, it can be able to sue or be sued in a court of law. So therefore this case law states that no person can bring an action in a court of law on behalf of the company, but it is only the company itself acting upon a decision already taken or approved by the majority of the members of the company. So remember in a company, any resolution or any decision basically is normally taken by members being able to vote or approve at a general meeting of the company. So once the members have been able to meet at a general meeting of the company and they have voted for it, then the company will undertake such a resolution or basically such an action that has been approved by the members of the company. So therefore, in this case, you are saying under the majority rule or the rule enforced by Sabu 2, any decision that basically the company will be able to undertake, then it simply means that the majority have already actually approved at a general meeting of the company. So in this case, for example, if it is an action that is supposed to be brought before the court, uh, then it is only the company itself that can be able to do so, but not an individual member or let's say, for example, like a shareholder of the company, bringing that particular action on behalf of the company. So you can be able to see one of the advantages of this particular case law or the majority rule, it is that number one, it actually normally recognizes the principle of separate legal entity that a company will actually always be a separate entity from the owners. Therefore, cases are in other zipeleka kotini kiviake. Note that a member will be able to bring that action on behalf of the company. It should be the company itself against another party, the company versus another party, maybe the accused or maybe the defendant, but not actually an individual on behalf of the company because a company is a person on its own. So number one advantage, it recognizes the principle of separate legal entity. Advantage number two, it actually basically avoids what we call multiplicity of suits. Let's assume, let's say for example, if all of us are actually members of a company, are members of a company. So there's a wrong that has been done to the company. So today you might find that me, I'm going to the court to basically seek an action on behalf of the company. So Millicent not having the knowledge, Millicent not having the knowledge, basically probably maybe tomorrow also, he'll be able to go to the court and bring the same action. So the same case, in this case, the other day Boaz also goes to the court and brings the same action without my knowledge or Millicent's knowledge. So you can see there's actually repetitive actions in a court of law. One was brought by, so Helen is saying I'm too fast. Helen is saying I'm too fast. Helen is saying I'm too fast. So I don't know if you are taking notes or what, So, but just remember that these particular notes, I've already shared them. I've already shared them in the group. So. Perhaps you can just take short notes, but if you want to get the deeper details, I've already shared the notes. I've already shared the notes. I've already shared the notes. So I can see that camera is off. So let me see if I can put it on.
in this account that we take the amount of profit or loss. So now you know how to close various accounts. Yes, I've shown you how to do allowance for that next entity. What I need to show you next is what? How to prepare an expert for? Oh, there's something basic for Oh, yes. Yes, yes. If you find the first thing uh, uh, come to your headquarters or to go to your education. So as, as I was saying, uh, so, so uh, this is to Helen. So I think these notes I've already shared. Eh? So you know, I'm just going through the notes I've shared. So probably here you can just take uh, short notes, but the notes I've already shared. So if you, what I'm explaining, if you go to read the notes, is the same thing that is in the notes. So the notes are already with you. So if basically you are writing, take very short notes, very short notes, very short notes. So summarize the points I'm basically saying here. So if you write everything, you'll be repeating what I've already sent in the notes. You'll be repeating what I've already sent in, in the notes. So what you do here, you take short notes, you take short notes. Don't write probably like everything I'm saying because everything I'm saying, it is in the notes I've already sent. So it is like you'd be repeating writing what i've already shared in soft notes that i've already sent so here you probably just take like short notes so if it is a point you summarize it very very fast you just summarize it just summarize it of course already i can repeat eh? i can repeat so that you can be able to summarize what i've said for example i've said eh, the majority rule it states that no person just listen to what i'm saying no person can bring an action on behalf of the company in a court of law, but it is only the company itself, but it is only the company itself by acting upon a decision already taken or approved by the majority of the members of the company. 
hakuna mtu anaweza leta kesi kwa koti on behalf of the company on behalf of the company but ni kampuni yenyewe inaweza leta hiyo kesi kwa koti by acting hii decision ni kwamba watu wa hiyo kampuni wameamua kampuni iende kwa koti so they will decide and say that the company can take the action so it can go to the court so the company now will present that case in a court of law in its own name remember a company is a separate legal entity part of the characteristics it can be able to sue or be sued in its own name no person can bring an action in a court of law on behalf of the company but it is only the company itself by acting upon a decision already approved by the majority of the members of the company a company cannot can only be able to undertake a certain action once the majority have actually voted and actually approved in a general meeting of the company in this case it simply means that the company members have met at a general meeting and they have approved that the company can be able to go to the court to be, maybe remedy any wrong done to the company by any person so therefore you are seeing the advantages of this particular case law number one it recognizes the principle of separate legal entity it recognizes the principle of separate legal entity number two it avoids the multiplicity of suits kurudia rudia kupeleka kesi kwa koti na watu individually we are saying for example in this case today masi has gone to the court to defend this company of ours tomorrow it's me going to the court without the knowledge that masi had already done it maybe yesterday the other day naomi is still going to the court you realize that after three or four days there is the same action in a court of law but in this case if it was being presented only by the company it would have been basically just only one action so it avoids the multiplicity of suits so that is actually also the advantage of the majority rule or the rule in force versus habitual or the rule in force versus habitual so we are seeing the majority rule the majority will have their way but of course the minority will have their say so the majority in this case once they have approved the company can undertake the action by simply going to the court but of course we'll see later on under the exceptions remember i told you all these major case laws in company law they have exceptions so under Solomon versus Solomon and Company Limited, we saw the exceptions. Under that other one that we saw in the last class, Royal British Bank versus Taquant, it has exceptions. So in this case, the minority will have their way under the exceptions. So even though the majority have approved under certain exceptional circumstances, the minority might actually be able to come in and actually overturn that decision of the majority. So at this particular point, I would like to end it there by you being able to know that this rule, it states no person can bring an action in a court of law on behalf of the company, but it is only the company itself by acting upon addition that is actually already been undertaken upon by the majority of the members of the company. Another key point, what are the advantages? It actually recognizes the principle of separate legal entity. Number two, it avoids the multiplicity of suits. If basically you can just be able to remember that, then you've known a lot about this particular case. You don't have even to know any other thing. You just need to know what the teacher has said and of course the advantages. The other key important thing that you must be able to know and we'll look at it next time are the exceptions to the majority rule. Under what circumstances can the decision of the majority not stand and of course be basically overturned maybe by the minority so we look at the exceptions to the majority rule in our next class and of course probably i'm seeing us winding up this topic next time and of course starting the next topic but before we, we basically look at another topic probably we look at some questions on uh, membership of a company we look at some questions before we start the next class so that you see how basically they, they have been able to test on membership of of a company in the past papers in the past papers in the past papers so i can see uh i can see time is almost up so unless there's a question you can uh, ask you can ask 
unless there's a question you can ask, you can ask. Unless there's a question you can uh, ask. Can I have the recorded videos on topic one and topic two? Uh, okay, I, I have videos in the past which were recorded, but for this semester I haven't recorded any, unless th this one I've recorded. But um, the other ones probably you'll get them for the other semesters I taught. But for this semester, most of the classes I haven't recorded because I was actually informed that uh, already videos are there, so don't record. So there are the videos which I had recorded previously, like the other semester. So probably they could be of help. You can talk to, maybe I'll talk to the admin. Or you can remind me. You can remind me so that I see if you can be able to get them or see what we can be able to do. I can see Kenneth is complaining. Hello, sir. The communication about the rescheduled class was made late. We haven't managed to attend some of some of us. Uh, can we have the video? So lucky enough, I've been able to record. So I'll make arrangements for the video. Lucky enough, I've been able to record. I can see also Lucy is saying that uh, uh, Lucy is saying that. Uh, uh, Kindly, Malimu, in future, <clears throat> such rescheduling of our class, please let it be communicated on time to enable us to adjust ourselves. Some of us have as have back-to-back -back meetings and other engagements. So probably we'll be communicating on time. So it won't happen again. Probably we'll be communicating on time in case there's actually any rescheduling of of our class but rarely classes are actually rescheduled rarely here classes will be rescheduled unless maybe it is under special circumstances uh, so rarely they're usually rescheduled so maybe this will be the first I mean, probably maybe the last experience we'll have of our class being rescheduled but they are just normally on the times that are normally uh, set that are normally set So having no any other concern, so uh, having no any other concern, so we'll I'll make arrangements for the video to be shared, for the video to be shared, for the benefit of those who have joined late, and of course those who probably who might have missed there, uh, because I can see there's someone who has actually just joined us now. I think it's Rhoda, so probably she has missed like the whole session. So I'll make arrangements for uh, the video to be shared. I'll follow up for the arrangements for the video to be shared. <clears throat> 